Well, hello, city. I'm so glad to be with you again. Uh, I'm so glad that we get together like this. Last time I chatted to you, I was only a dad of one. And uh, this time I am now a dad of two. And uh, so we have been just so blessed and so supported uh, by our church family. Uh, having a newborn baby boy in the house has been a great season. And uh, I really want to say thank you to each person who sent us a message, to everyone who's been praying for us. I was literally uh, prepping this sermon, prepping this message. I was about three quarters of the way through late at night uh, when my wife came through with some contractions. And I had to ask, is this the real deal? And uh, it was. And just before 6 a.m., uh, our little baby boy, Jaden Thomas, uh, entered in the world. And uh, we were just so blessed by the outpouring of prayer uh, uh, and gifts and just support that we receive. We love this family. And so we are excited. Pray for us. Continue to pray for us. If you've ever gone from one child to two children, you will know things get real. And so uh, we're in the midst of it, but we're enjoying it. I'm so glad to be sharing this message with you um, today. Uh, I'm really excited because we're closing out this series. Um, it's a series that we've called Revive. Because we know that during this time for so many, um, through this pandemic and this crisis that we're really facing, we are in a time of rebuild. Uh, as a city, as a nation, as a community, as a people, um, we know that we are desperately in need uh, of reviving our economy, of reviving our society, our livelihoods. But we don't want to miss in the context of our community that God is doing something very special in reviving our faith and our hope in Him. God's always present in the suffering and he's present in this situation right now. And we know as we look through scripture and all of human history that God is the great rebuilder. And so if we're looking for revival and rebuilding, isn't God the one we should be turning to? The truth is COVID-19 has not thwarted uh, the move of God, the plan of God, the hand of God. There's a great future that awaits the people of God. And we know there is a world so desperate to know about it. And so we get to look again at God's word, his truth, and what it has to say to us. I really have so enjoyed seeing this revival stirring. And it's one that's available to you and to me, to our community and to our world. And the question I want to lay out as we jump into this, will we be a part of that? We're going to take a look at uh, one of my favorite characters uh, in scripture today. And it's the prophet Jonah. And you see, as God acts and interacts with Jonah, we really see the education of the, per, uh, the prophet Jonah in the purpose of God. And uh, we know what Jonah is famous for. We know that in scripture, he just had a whale of a time. But isn't it funny that in the education of Jonah, that education came through a time of isolation. That him being in the belly of a whale, isolated, God was actually educating him in his purpose. I, wanna, I, I wonder as we're in this isolation period through 2020, what would God educate us in? I don't know if you've noticed, I've seen so many, it doesn't matter how introverted you are. Even in this time of isolation, we have again rediscovered this desire, deep desire that God's put in us to connect, a desire for connection. I wonder what else there is that God is wanting to reveal through this time. So we're going to jump into Jonah chapter one, and we're going to take kind of a, uh, we're going to focus really in on chapter one, but really take a big view of Jonah's story and what that has to say to us. So you can follow along with me uh, in verse one of chapter one. It's going to pop up. I do encourage you if you're taking notes, um, this is a great time to be doing that. Um, really is talking about how God is speaking to you individually. This is what it says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The word comes to Jonah. It's the word of God. Go and send my message to Nineveh. He ups and leaves. He flees. He runs uh, from the purpose of God, literally gets on a ship and goes the other direction. And it's in that place in that season of running, God will show Jonah the power of his purpose. And so he throws a great storm over the sea. Continues in verse 4, it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, that's the sailors, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah 
had gone, gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not par- perish. These sailors are so scared and in their fear, they begin to cast lots. They're trying to work out what is going on. And they, the lots fall to Jonah. They work out that Jonah's the problem. And they confront him about it. He tells them uh, what he has done and who exactly he's running from. They had heard of this God of the Bible. And so they were even more afraid. And he realizes in that moment, he wants to avoid the awkward moment. Jonah helps these guys out. He says, you know what? It maybe is just better. Throw me overboard. He's coming after me. He's not too worried about you. Save yourselves. I want to give these sailors credit because they think about it for a minute. They take a moment. They look for other options, but eventually they obey his words. And it continues in verse 15 and says, So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the story goes on. We know the famous part. Jonah gets swallowed up by the great fish, a whale. And there's always a debate. Was it a whale? Was it just a big fish? I'm not going to touch that today. It's not important to what we're looking at. But you can chat about it in the comments section. Just keep it short. Jonah's in the midst of this actual identity crisis. And God's actually going to see him through it. He eventually does repent. He turns around and follows the purpose of God. He goes to Nineveh. He proclaims the message. And Nineveh gets saved. Nineveh repent. They turn back to God. But ironically, Jonah's not happy about this. You fast forward to the end. And what we don't know in chapter 1 gets revealed at the end of the story of Jonah. That actually he was not running because of fear of the Ninevites. He was running because he actually feared that God would save them. What it reveals was deep in his heart, Jonah was struggling with bigotry. Jonah was actually a racist. He didn't believe that these people were worth being saved by God. That's a whole nother preach. We're not going to get there. Um, But as we dive into this passage, as we uh, look at how we will reach the world and how God is reviving um, our community to reach a world so desperate for it, my plan of action is simple. We're going to look at two commands that are given uh, to Jonah in this passage, and the two commands I believe are given to us. Two points. First one is awake. Second one is arise. Just two words. First one, point number one, awake. Whenever you talk about the purpose of God, You can't ever talk about it outside of the context of identity. These two things, purpose and identity, are so connected. Because as you track God's working in humanity, as you track His working with people uh, in Scripture that He calls to great purpose, um, we see this run, we see this uh, process, we see this journey. That it starts with identity because identity will run to presence. Presence will set a priority in what is important. Priority will set uh, the steps and the steps will power you into the future and the purpose that God has. Now, God has to be in every single one of those steps. God's the one who sets and gives an identity. He's the one who is the presence that we will dive into. He gets to set the priority and the destination. He's the one who will order the strategy and the steps and eventually bring out his purpose in us. But so often in our humanity, in our uh, sinful nature, we try to pull God out of that process. We try to pull God out of that journey. And we see that happening here in Jonah. Jonah needed an awakening. He actually needed to awake in a few things. And I want to take a, a look at a couple of them. The first one I want to look at is, I believe he needed to awake in truth. There's, uh, in the very first verse, there's a little phrase that we so easily can gloss over. It says, Jonah, the son of Amittai. And if you look deeper at what Amittai actually means, you'll find that Amittai means my truth. And so when scripture says Jonah, the son of Amittai, what it is actually saying is Jonah, the son of my truth. It's something we can so easily uh, move past, but not realize that in every single verse, in every single word, there's intention from God wanting to communicate to us. And for Jonah, this was his moment where uh, God was saying to him, remember who you are. Remember you are to awake in my truth. We all think the big remember who you are moment is from the Lion King movie. The truth is it came thousands of years before in the story of Jonah. Now this education of Jonah 
uh, must begin with this awakening. And he's a very unique prophet within scripture um, because the usual uh, process, the usual formula when you look at prophets in the Bible, when you look at the prophetic writing in scripture is this, that a prophet will represent God, that God will use a prophet to speak to a people. Jonah's quite different. God turns it on his head. The Jonah formula is now actually that God will use a people. He will use the Ninevites to speak to a prophet. We know there are things in Jonah, there are things that are deep in his heart that God's wanting to deal with. God's really wanting to uh, very clearly speak to his heart, his mind, his soul, and make known to him his truth, his way, his mission, and his purpose. And as Jonah was in the ship, going down into the depths of the ship, and was physically asleep, I don't want us to miss that simultaneously he was spiritually asleep to the things of God. He was uh, not understanding that God's heart is for all people, not just some. And so God embarks in this awakening. And I love this moment in, in the verse where it says that God hurled a great storm upon the sea. It's such a great word, such a great picture. And I don't want us to miss the intention, the intentionality of God, that out of everywhere, God picks out this geographic location where Jonah is to throw a great storm. And his intention is to get the attention of Jonah. It reminded me so vividly of a moment I had as a dad. The truth is a father will always love their child, protect their child, and there will come a moment where a father needs to get their child's attention. Um, We live on a ground floor unit. Um, We have an amazing little uh, communal garden that wraps around our our building. And so as you come out our sliding door, uh, you have this awesome grass, nice grass embankment, rocks, Uh, that my toddler absolutely loves to climb and get all around. And uh, she's got energy. She does not stop. The truth is she has uh, one switch and it's on and off. And when she's off, it's she's sleeping. Otherwise, she's 100% high energy all the time going. And I remember we were outside and uh, she was enjoying uh, her time outside, running around, climbing rocks, enjoying it. But just a, a, a bit further away, Um, from our door there's a patch of grass and uh, in that patch of grass uh, at this time of year there is a a great bloom and it's not a bloom of flowers it is a bloom of thorns and it's not the nice thorns it's those thorns that have like the three triangles um, and they're absolute death I call them Satan's toenail clippings because I really believe that's what they are if you stand it's not just one or two it's like 300 in your foot now, as a, having a toddler running around the grass, we've had some encounters. And I remember sitting up on the uh, grass embankment watching uh, her play. And uh, she had a moment where something got her attention. Uh, a bunch of birds had landed on the other side of this patch of grass. And uh, being a toddler who's very interested in high energy, uh, she noticed this. Uh, she's beginning to speak. And so she exclaimed, birdies, and took off running. I now, as a dad, have this moment where I can see what's going to happen. I can see the birds, I can see my child, I can see the thorns. I recognize the imminent danger, I recognize what what will come in the next few seconds and it will be a high degree of pain. I also have done, had that moment where everything stops and you start to do the calculations. You work out you're a bit too far away to actually run and stop her. And then you start to look at other things and how you can get involved. And I noticed just next to me, there was a pink princess, little mermaid ball. And uh, in that moment where everything had stopped as a dad, watching this all go down, you realize thorns, child, ball, and you put it all together. And so as a loving dad, I hurled this ball at my child. And uh, I want to tell you, I hit her square in the back of the head. I, I was trying to aim for legs just to get attention. I hit her head and to say I wasn't impressed with myself would be a lie. The truth was it was a distance and it was a great throw. And if you've ever seen those balls, it's those plastic ones, the ones you get at pick and pay, they're always in that like weird rope string cage. Um, it's not going to hurt her, but those things don't fly true. So understand this is an amazing throw. But immediately it stopped her in her tracks. It got her attention. And she turned back to me with wide eyes and just said one word, Daddy. Now, I realized in this moment she has now stopped. And so I've got a chance. I got up and took off running. 
I realized it could have gone one of two ways. She could have got scared and run the other way. Luckily, she's got a dad that she loves. And so she exclaimed, dad, and ran toward me and jumped into my arms. And so crisis was averted. But I want you to know that there are moments like this where a parent will need to get the attention of their child. And this is what we're seeing as God is getting the attention of Jonah as he hurls this storm to get in the path of Jonah as he's fleeing and running in the wrong direction. I wonder how many of us have had a moment like this, uh, a moment where God very clearly was trying to get our attention in a situation. Maybe you're sitting here uh, listening to the sound of my voice, wherever you're streaming this from, and you're in that moment right now where you're realizing, God, you're, you're trying to get my attention here. I'm starting to see your move. I'm starting to see what you're doing here. I don't ever want you to be in that place where you're starting to see the intention of God, but forget the motivation behind it. God's motivation in trying to get our attention is like a father. He's always protecting. He's always caring because it's actually grounded, foundationally built in his immeasurable love for you and me. We can't miss his absolute love for us, his motivation, even in his intention, when that can sometimes get a bit confused. That's the first thing, awaken truth. Second thing, it might sound confusing, but I believe that actually um, Jonah's story is actually calling us to be ones who are living awake. We're awake in truth, but we're living awake. If you've heard me preach before, you'll know uh, that this is something that's close to my heart. When you look at characters in the Bible who get it wrong, uh, characters who maybe say the wrong things, do the wrong things, um, commit things that are maybe unthinkable, so often we make the mistake of writing them off of laughing at them, of making fun. Like, how could you ever do that? How could you ever think that? How could you ever say that? But the truth is, so often in this, those stories, so often uh, when you take a deeper look at those characters, what you will find is pictures of ourselves. What you will find is people uh, in Scripture playing out our lives, how we think, how we act, how we talk. And the truth is we have so much to learn. And I believe Jonah is one of those characters. I believe he was actually, and, and you might get thrown by that saying, Dunks, you've just told me Jonah was uh, a right-wing rebel uh, racist. How on earth is he like me? When you look at some of the main characteristics of Jonah in his character and in how God was interacting with him, what you'll find is he is a rebel. What you'll find is he's actually a walking paradox. He has moments of wins and moments of losses. He has moments where he is faithful to God and moments where he is faithless. And the truth is, when we look at our own hearts and our own stories, do we not have moments like that? The truth is, we've got far, far more in common with this rebel prophet and so much to learn from him. This is what I'm meaning when I, I, I say I believe we should be living awake. That the awakening God was bringing to Jonah wasn't just meant to be a one-time deal. This was actually uh, God bringing Jonah into walking daily with him, living in a state of spiritual awareness. Not in some freaky deaky way, but I believe when those, uh, those of us are in a relationship with God, when we are walking with Him daily, we are actually so aware that we're able to track His movements, that we're able to track the hand of God in every situation. And that's what God was wanting to do with Jonah. Jonah had a storm that he needed to deal with. It was a storm he had brought upon himself that was thrown at him by the hand of God. Now, the truth is, uh, not every storm that comes our way will be because of a consequence of our own action or even coming at us because of the hand of God. Sometimes we will deal with storms that are simply uh, there because of the brokenness of our world. But we know this truth that we will encounter storms in this life. And how we respond and how we react is so important. And this awakeness, this spiritual awareness is going to be so important because those who are in relationship with Jesus, this becomes a weapon where we're actually able to see deeper and understand what God is doing in every situation. During this time verse that's been coming up for me just time and time again is Isaiah 43, 19. God's words are this, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? It's something that has struck me so deeply because it builds this foundation that God is always moving that God is always uh, in the business of progress, that he will take what is bad and he will turn it for good. And there'll be moments where we look at a situation and a circumstance and we might not know at a surface level what's going on, but we know that under it, God is working. He's moving. We know these things. 
But the question this verse poses is, do we perceive what's going on underneath? Are we, being a, are we able to track the hand of God? Are we able to uh, see the word of God at work? Are we able to see the move of the hand and the heart of God in every circumstance? I was having a conversation with a really good friend of mine. Um, He's an amazingly gifted leader uh, and he's got a business mind like you cannot um, believe. And we were obviously discussing everything that's happening in our world. We're talking about the economic struggle we're seeing. We're seeing the financial disruption of so many individuals. And I spoke about this verse and saying, you know, a big desire for me throughout this whole period, this whole season has been that we wouldn't miss what God is doing. That where God is wanting to educate, where God is wanting to build, uh, we wouldn't miss that. We wouldn't just get caught up in the crisis, that we would perceive what God is doing. And he blew me away with his response. Because he said, you know what, Doug, so our problem is not just that we are missing what God is doing, but we will miss what God will do. Because the truth is, we need to know both of those things simultaneously. That actually that awareness will help us know what God is doing but also what God will do. And we can't have just one without the other. We need the context of what God's doing in the present so that we can look forward to the future and the hope that he has for us. We come unstuck in our awareness because we really only are thinking on this kind of two-dimensional level where we weigh things up, where it's simply a a win or a loss. It's simply good or bad. It's it's black or white. And even in business, it's a profit or a loss. And he used this uh, illustration. Imagine a a large company in South Africa. So many are struggling right now. But imagine one goes belly up. It goes under. And so employees now lose their income. They lose their employment. They lose their jobs. And when you play that out at a small level, at an individual level, it's very clear that there's a loss. There's a loss of income. There's a loss of business. Um, For customers, there is now a gap that is there where now they cannot get the service that they used to. There's suppliers who were benefiting from the work this company was doing that now uh, have this vacuum, this gap that's been left. And at a small level, we look and we say it's simply a loss. But when you think about it at a deeper level, at a bigger level, take a wider angle, what you realize is that gap will eventually be filled. That there maybe is a large company somewhere else in the world, maybe a large company in the UK that will step into it and actually start to service those customers start to bring the benefit to those suppliers. And so that income that was in South Africa now has shifted. And so now instead of someone being paid in South Africa and spending their money on a F&B home loan and, and, and uh, and buying groceries at pick and pay, you now have someone sitting in London doing the same job, getting that same income, spending their money at Barclays and spending it at their money on groceries at Tesco. And so at a wider level, we've seen there's actually been a shift. So often we get an incomplete view where we would simply say, this is just simply and only a loss. We maybe miss at a bigger level, there's a shift. For Jonah, the storm was uh, God's anger against him. God was coming to get him. It was a trial he couldn't enjoy. He actually gets to the point where he says, you know what, it's better for me just to die. He believes it was punishment, but he is missing the shift that God's desiring, not just in his heart and his head, but actually in the trajectory of his life toward the purpose that God had for him. When storms hit, we can approach these things in different ways. Maybe we will approach it with worldly thinking. We we maybe approach it with kind of the, the Jonah as the sleeper or even the sailors where it's simply how do we survive the potential loss? Do everything we can to survive the loss because that's all we see. The people of God who are able to track his hand see it differently because they're actually going to perceive the shift even before it hits because they know that God had in his love and his mercy for us in the hope that he has for us in the future that God works what is bad and he turns it into good where others will see loss we see a shift where others are looking at to the waves and to the wind and to the storm we see a savior who walks on the water we see a savior who calms the storm and we are called to do the same this idea of awake and arise uh, reminded me of a passage in Ephesians where Paul writes and he quotes from Isaiah 26 in Ephesians 5 14 it says therefore it says awake O sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you 
He makes the connection between remembering who we are, that we've been made alive in Christ, that we're empowered by the Spirit, that actually we have been built for a purpose, a great purpose in God. And so he connects these two things. So it's not just a bit about awake. It's actually about awake and then arise. Let's jump into point number two. Arise. First thing I want to talk about in arise is I want you to notice that they arise in worship. Just for a moment, let's take a deeper look at these sailors. Uh, the passage calls them mariners. They would have been professional sailors. And for them, we notice that their arise moment, where this thing kind of all ends, is in worship. They respond in worship. Maybe you're sitting in this place. Maybe you're listening to the sound of my voice. And this is actually all new to you. Maybe you're someone who has uh, not really been around church, not really got deep into um, the biblical truth of who God is. I want to encourage you, take a look at the sailors because they were in that boat. They were ones who didn't know this God. They had maybe heard of him, but they didn't know him. But we see in verse 15 and 16, they pick up Jonah, they hurl him into the sea. The sea stops uh, from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And we're not talking about fear in the sense of just being scared out of your mind. We're talking about a reverent fear. Hey, this God is the real deal. They had cried out to their other gods, uh, these other deities that were, that were not the real deal. But when it comes to this God, he's the real deal. And so they have a fear of him, a reverent fear of them. And they respond, they, they offer a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. What can we learn from the sailors? In their journey, they were so scared. And I want you to know they were, uh, they were sailors. They were professionally uh, trained to deal with this. So when a storm comes that they literally are scared to the bone by, you must know what kind of a storm it was. That actually they had no clue in this moment. They realized uh, their weakness in that they couldn't do anything to save themselves. It was a storm they couldn't handle. And we see this desire within them to seek something greater. They begin to cry out uh, to the gods that they knew. But as those gods failed, as those gods didn't make the grade, they'll go for anything they can. They're throwing things out. They're trying to lighten the load and save themselves. But when the God of the Bible is revealed to them, as that storm is calmed, I love that they respond in worship. I love that they, in that moment, offer a sacrifice. That in that moment, they make vows. This wasn't just a one-time deal. This was actually them saying, we're all in. We're going to make a vow that from this day forward, we will serve no one else but this God alone. It's amazing in their response, how they arise in worship. And if you're in that space where you are new to this, I want to encourage you. And I want to ask you the question. Do you want to know the power of God's salvation? Are you sitting in the same boat as these sailors? Because they were hit with the grace and the mercy of God. They were hit with the gospel, the good news. And they realized it was so powerful that it could even come through a rebellious uh, right wing runaway prophet like Jonah. And they didn't know who this God was, but through this broken prophet, it gets revealed to them. Now being this side of the cross and this side of knowing Jesus, we actually have far greater knowledge of a far greater prophet. Jesus speaks in Matthew uh, chapter 12, and he speaks of the sign of Jonah, speaking about himself. In verse 40, he says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus gets on the scene and he's the real deal. If you want to know what empowers us to arise in worship, to arise from the sleeping state, the dead state we find ourselves in, you need to know that Jesus arose from the dead. That Jesus was the ultimate prophet. That he was the one who did not shrink back from the purpose God had set for him. The mission God had set for him. That while we are sitting there not able to save ourselves, he went to Calvary. And he died on the middle cross because of his great love for you and me. But better than that, the story doesn't end there. It doesn't end in death. It ends in him defeating the grave. And he defeats all of our failure and shortcoming. 
So every single missed opportunity, every single Jonah moment, every single moment where we are faithless, where we miss the mark, every single one of our shortcomings is, is paid for once and for all by Jesus and his sacrifice for you and me. He puts them to death forever. I said in the beginning, it was so amazing that through this isolation, we've desired deeper connection. Isn't it even more amazing that in Jesus's isolation, in him being uh, forsaken for three days and three nights, we can find connection to God. We can find salvation in Him. God will take what is bad and He will turn it for our good. He'll take that storm and He'll calm it. And He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. That's a rise in worship. Second thing I want to talk about is a rise in mission. The lesson God teaches Jonah is that uh, His mercy, His grace was for all people. And that if we're called into that mission, into that purpose, then we should be doing the same. I love how Micah 6, 8 puts it. It's so simple, yet so profound. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good. If you want to know what is good, if you want to know how to live this life, how to walk this journey with God, um, with Jesus at the center, with Jesus leading everything, do this. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those three things lay it out, that we would be a people who do justice, who love mercy, and who walk humbly with our God. This is where I want to wrap it up. Jonah misses the first command of arise in chapter one. We see it. He runs the other way. He flees. But amazingly, in the grace that God has for him, he gives him a second chance because another arise comes. In chapter three, it says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. I love that. I love that as a church, I really do believe, as God first city, as the church, big C, the church of Jesus around the world, we are in that moment where we have heard the first arise. But for too long, we found ourselves in the comfort of the inner part of the ship, where we have been in that sleeping state, that perceived safety, where our experience has been um, being in it uh, with people, but not really being in it for them and their eternity. The truth is we have a world who's clueless. We have a world who's been tossed side to side um, by every storm of life, people being absolutely crippled by fear and failure. And it's marked by lives that are these futile attempts to try and save ourselves. So many people are just stuck in that that moment of tossing the cargo overboard, trying to lighten the load so that they can get through. But the truth is they can't save themselves. And I say they as if it's different. But the truth is we know that they are us and we are them. But, and it's a big but, we know where we're going. And we know who's taking us there. And so if we know the question is, why are we not telling them? If there's a world to reach, why are we not reaching them? When we have our moments where we go astray, where we get it wrong, why are we not telling ourselves that truth again? Have we missed the boat? Have we got this thing wrong? Did we miss our chance? As we look through scripture, as we look at God's truth, the answer is amazing because it's no. Because God is the God of second chances. We heard our first arise, but God's going to bring the second. And for God, we know the second can mean a third, a fourth, a twelfth, a ninety-ninth. The word he will bring again to each one of us, to us as a community, is arise. Arise to reach a world that is so desperate for him. Arise to reach uh, people who are sitting in a boat in a storm, not knowing what to do, not able to save themselves. Not knowing that there's a God who has a ocean of grace and mercy and love that he wants to outpour. I don't want to lead us in a big response. I want to end this thing with one simple question. Do we need to be awakened? Do we need to get again deep into God's truth about who we are and what he's calling us to do? And are we going to be the people who are courageous enough to arise and follow the purpose that he set for us? Why don't you pray with me and then we're going to worship. Father God, I want to thank you so much that even in Jonah, in his shortcomings, we see your grace, your mercy to him. Lord, there are things that you want to deal with in us. 
But we cannot do this thing on our own. We have to do it empowered by you. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that actively you would fill every single person who hears the sound of my voice. That actively you would make yourself known. That your truth would speak loudly over each one of our lives. That Lord, your purpose would be so clear. That Lord, when we're in circumstances where we can't track your hand, where we're not quite sure what you are doing, Lord, would you help us not just see a loss, but see the shift that you're taking us into. Lord, I pray for us in this season that we would be a church, a people, a community, a family who reach out to a world that are so desperate for your grace and love. Lord, we have the answer. We have uh, the ticket. Lord, will we make it available to absolutely everyone we possibly can. We love you. We want to serve you. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's worship together.